Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is um, Jinan Bao. I'm a KK Lee professor at uh, Chemical Engineering Department. Uh, also, uh, I have courtesy appointment with uh, Material Science uh, as well as uh, Chemistry Department. Uh, I'm also currently the department chair for uh, Chemical Engineering. Uh, then in terms of um, research activity, uh, I also run an initiative in Stanford. It's called the Stanford Wearable Electronics uh, Initiative, where we uh, try to gather students and faculty on campus from um, different schools, uh, ranging from School of Humanity and Science, School of Engineering, and School of Medicine, uh, to work together on building the next generation of uh, wearable electronics. Uh, but today, I'm going to tell you about work uh, we do in my group related to uh, energy area. Uh, so first, uh, since now I can still see everybody, just want to get a quick idea of um, uh, how many of you are uh, from chemistry background. Okay, material science. Okay, chemical engineering. Okay, <laughs> only one. Oh, and uh, electrical engineering. Okay, uh, mechanical engineering. All right, civil, any civil engineering, environmental. Okay, did I miss any? No? Okay. All right. Very diverse background. So I will try to make, make my talk um, accessible to everyone, um, but it may be a little bit more um, kind of uh, chemistry and uh, material um, intensive because that's the core of uh, research we do uh, in my group. Uh, so you will, uh, throughout this week, you will hear uh, many faculty members talking about research related to energy, but every group has a different core uh, fundamental expertise. In my group, the core is um, polymer materials. Uh, and uh, my group is uh, very diverse, uh, has one third people coming from chemistry, chemical engineering background, uh, and one third from material science um, um, and uh, also chemical engineering. Uh, and then another one third on electrical engineering, bioengineering, mechanical engineering. So those type of work we do ranges from synthesis design of new molecules. Uh, and uh, usually these molecules are designed for a certain purpose. And the applications we look at ranges from um, sensors, electronic circuits, batteries, and uh, either uh, even implantable electronic devices. Uh, and then in uh, taking the molecules to the final devices, we also need to understand how we can um, process the molecules and make them assemble into certain uh, well-controlled nanostructure so that their electrical and the mechanical properties can be uh, well-controlled. Uh, so that's the part in the middle. So we have research activities um, uh, in all three areas. And then the final application uh, give us the feedback to the materials design to allow us to better understand how we can come up with better materials. Um, the um, overall research activities uh, in my group, um, uh, most of the um, uh, materials and devices we work, work on uh, are in the middle part, uh, that is uh, skin inspired electronics, where we come up with new electronic materials that are uh, uh, like skin uh, with stretchability, self-healing property, biodegradability, and um, uh, tissue compatibility. 
And then we take these materials to explore their uh, possible applications and they enable new applications. So those are areas like um, uh, skin smart sensors, uh, new forms of uh, circuits and displays, uh, chemical biological sensors, implantable devices, robotics. Um, and then the materials here also um, uh, allows us to uh, think about, uh, in addition to application that are uh, clearly connected to functions of human skin, uh, what other unique applications they may enable. So that's how we started the work with um, battery energy um, storage materials. Basically, it was a spin-off from material, new type of electronic material that we developed for skin-like, uh, skin-inspired electronics. Uh, but then we started to find um, many unique uh, applications of these materials. And then it becomes a, a very important branch of research in my group. Uh, right now, uh, we've been working on this uh, area for 10 years now. Uh, and we have a group uh, typically of seven or eight uh, students and postdocs working uh, in this general area. And then we also have a small effort uh, related to electrocatalysis uh, by developing uh, conducting porous materials, either based on these uh, two-dimensional organic molecules or um, uh, well-controlled synthesis of these um, uh, carbon nanomaterials uh, for electrocatalysis. So today uh, I'm going to tell you about the use of polymers, uh, specifically uh, the polymers that uh, we work with uh, uh, to, and their applications uh, for to enable high energy density uh, batteries. Uh, and this class of polymer is called self-healing polymer. And I'm going to explain to you what they are and what's special about them and why uh, they are particularly interesting for battery applications. Okay, uh, so this came out of uh, our long-term vision of uh, making electronics beyond smartphones uh, to this is the roadmap we give to eventually go into implantables. And I mentioned we use skin as the inspiration. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, when we look at the skin as a material, the properties, flexibility, stretchability, biodegradability and self-healing, these are the unique properties we find particularly intriguing to incorporate into future generation of um, electronics. So the, um, the key uh, molecular design okay. concept. Oh, sorry, that this was taped uh, in another talk. And self healing materials in recent years is the incorporation of dynamic cross links into polymer networks instead of the covalent linkages in conventional elastomers. The breakage of covalent bonds due to large strain will result in cracks and irreversible damage to the film. On the other hand, breaking dynamic bond is a mechanism for energy dissipation. In certain polymer design, dynamic bonds may form simultaneously when others are breaking to replenish them. Incorporating such an energy dissipation mechanism in addition to other ones, such as chain elongation, alignment, and crystal breakage, allows polymer network to gain a larger fracture energy and sustain a larger strain before damage. Dynamic polymer networks is an active area of research. There are many examples of chemistry that can allow formation of dynamic polymer networks. Here, I only list a few. We have been working with non-covalent ones due to the large range of mechanical properties we can realize. The association constant and the bonding geometry play important roles on the resulting polymer network dynamics and the mechanical properties. For example, UPI unit pioneered by Bert Meyer 
has an association constant of 10 to the fifth. It results in a polymer network with solid-like rheological behavior, low dynamics, and high modulus. On the other hand, the association constant of urea is only around one. The resulting polymer network may be liquid-like if highly flexible polymer backbone is chosen with high dynamics and low modulus. Okay, sorry. It was uh, just uh, combining different slide deck. Uh, that happened to be two slides uh, that I had a voice recorded. Uh, this is showing an example of um, uh, the dynamic elastomer that we have made, uh, where if you cut the material and uh, put it back together, uh, when you uh, cause a fracture in the material, uh, the non-covalent uh, dynamic bonding I just mentioned earlier, uh, they have a weaker bonding strengths and they can break first. And then when you put the two pieces of materials together, uh, then these um, chemical bonds uh, can be formed readily at room temperature. So if you think about hydrogen bonding, that's what's holding uh, DNA and the protein together. And these bonds can readily form at room temperature. So that's the type of bonds that we incorporate into these polymers to allow them to be able to um, uh, tolerate high uh, strain to be stretchable, but at the same time, uh, be able to self-heal uh, upon applying a strain. So how does that relate to energy storage? Uh, so a little bit motivation of uh, why energy storage is important. Um, well, the, we're undergoing uh, climate change, uh, and a lot of it is related to uh, the, the way energy is generated um, uh, because of the power plant uh, usage, the coal burning power plant uh, for energy generation, and uh, uh, the cars uh, putting out um, waste gas, and all of these are causing uh, the contributing to the climate change. And, um, but if we go with uh, alternative energy, uh, fortunately, uh, their adoption is uh, getting more and more uh, widely spread. Uh, with solar and the wind uh, sources, they, the price is becoming uh, more and more competitive, so more people are starting to use them. But uh, solar energy is av only available during the day, and uh, wind uh, energy is uh, intermittent, intermittent, and it's not always uh, producing energy at a constant rate. Uh, so therefore, um, uh, and also at the same time, uh, for electrical vehicles, uh, still they're uh, quite expensive and most of the cost uh, comes from the uh, uh, battery themselves. So for all of these um, uh, important uh, alternative ways of generating energy, the uh, energy storage is uh, important so that whenever uh, the energy generating source is available, we can store the energy and then use uh, when needed. So what is a lithium ion battery? This is um, a, um, a, a simple diagram showing the uh, structure of a battery. Uh, so when uh, here there are two electrodes, one is the anode uh, and uh, uh, here is the cathode. And then in between, there is a separator. Basically, uh, currently it's a plas porous plastic material uh, to prevent the uh, cathode and the anode to be in direct contact with each other. Uh, since they are both conductive, uh, if they are in direct contact, then uh, they will be shorted. Uh, so there is an insulating porous separator in between. And then uh, there's also a liquid electrolyte that helps lithium, if it's a lithium ion battery, then lithium is the uh, ion that's being transported um, through this uh, membrane and uh, in between these electrodes. Uh, so if I charge up this battery, uh, then the lithium ion will be um, 
convert it into lithium um, metal and uh, deposit it on the anode. And uh, uh, here, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, onto the anode. And then when you discharge or use the battery, uh, for example, lighting up this um, uh, light bulb, uh, then the lithium metal will be oxidized uh, into lithium ion and then transport through the liquid electrolyte and uh, get to the cathode and then here gets reduced. So that's the very simple um, uh, schematics of lithium ion battery. Uh, here, this chart compares a uh, different type of um, uh, anode cathode uh, materials uh, that uh, so on the bottom is the anode material and uh, the, the one slash uh, on the right side is the cathode material. So there are different combinations of uh, choices of uh, materials that one can use. Uh, and then depending on these materials, the amount of uh, lithium ion that can be stored into the, uh, into the electrode material uh, will vary significantly. So that can be quantified by this uh, ma um, uh, maximum energy density, uh, which is a kilowatt hour per kilogram. So based on a certain weight, how much energy uh, one would be able to store. Of course, uh, the higher this value is, uh, the more desirable. Uh, and the current lithium ion battery is um, uh, the anode material is mostly based on uh, the uh, carbon or graphite. So this is uh, the one shown on the right. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that um, uh, during the charging process, uh, lithium ion will uh, enter the um, uh, graphite and it gets reduced. Uh, in the case of graphite, it works very well, and this um, uh, is used uh, for uh, the lithium ion battery that we use for our um, computers and uh, uh, cell phones. Uh, it works very well uh, because the lithium uh, is being hosted or uh, inside the graphite, and basically each graphite um, uh, it, it, uh, lithium intercalate, because graphite has this uh, layered structure, then lithium can intercalate into the graphite. And each carbon atom can host one lithium atom. Uh, so that determines uh, the amount of lithium that can be stored in a certain given amount of graphite. Uh, of course, uh, you may say that, uh, uh, why don't we just put in a lot of graphite and then we can store a lot of lithium. Uh, but the energy density based on the weight is very important. As you can has, have the battery hold more energy, but then it will be heavier. Uh, so um, that's not what we want for handheld devices. And also for electrical vehicle, um, we don't want the battery to take up uh, um, uh, most of the weight of the uh, vehicle and then a lot of power will be consumed uh, because of the heavy weight. So there's a limitation of uh, uh, how thick you can make this um, uh, graphite and how much energy uh, basically based on this uh, amount of lithium that can go in. Uh, so for with the known um, cathode material, these are mostly based on inorganic uh, lithium uh, compounds. Uh, then the energy density is marked uh, here. And you can see that the energy density uh, is still relatively low. Uh, then if we look at the choices of other materials, uh, you see mostly it's lithium, lithium, lithium. Uh, but then before the uh, additional lithium as um, anode, you can see, oh, here there's silicon. Silicon is uh, abundant and um, it's, uh, uh, I, if I remember correctly, second most abundant element on the earth. Uh, so if this can work as um, uh, cathode for lithium ion battery, then that will be uh, really economical and uh, also uh, look at the energy density. It's much higher compared to that of uh, graphite as the anode. Uh, 
Um, and the reason for that is um, uh, silicon can form alloy with um, uh, lithium. So every sing every one silicon atom can alloy with uh, 4.4 lithium um, on average. So you can see the ratio is completely inversed and a lot more lithium can be stored in silicon. Uh, so why, why not use silicon as the anode? Uh, well, the problem is um, the, um, for silicon, so on top is uh, the particles are representing silicon particles uh, for anode. And um, uh, then if you lithiate, and there uh, one silicon can hold 4.4 uh, lithium, and then this lithium will take up volume. So the silicon particle will have a big volume expansion uh, as high as four times of um, its uh, original size. Uh, and when we make this uh, electrode material, we can't just put powder and uh, the powder will just fall apart when we try to make an electrode. So we need to have some polymer. Uh, so that's represented by the uh, blue part, uh, blue coating. And this blue part is the polymer that's supposed to hold the lithium particle together. It also has to have uh, some conductivity. So we normally incorporate a little bit of carbon in it or carbon nanotube to make uh, this blue part to be electrically conductive and ion conductive. Uh, but the problem is uh, uh, silicon is um, very rigid and brittle. So um, if we charge it up, then the particle will have a thermal expan uh, have a expansion, volume expansion. And then when you discharge, silicon, uh, lithium will come come out of the uh, silicon, and then um, it will shrink. So when it expand and shrink, just a few cycles, uh, the um, particle will break and fracture into pieces. And the polymer around them, people typically have been using rigid polymer before because for carbon electrode, there is hardly any volume expansion. So they don't have to worry about the volume expansion issue. Uh, but using those polymers um, uh, in the case of silicon, uh, they will break apart as well when the uh, silicon particles have large uh, volume expansion. So that's uh, when uh, almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, we started working with uh, uh, Professor E. Trace group. Um, I had uh, uh, two postdocs at the time uh, from my group. Uh, one was developing self-healing material. One was uh, a expert who had a battery experience. Um, so when we thought, well, there these polymers can crack, then why don't we use self-healing? healing polymers. Self-healing polymer, even if they crack, uh, they can still heal and uh, recover the um, conduction pathway, ionic and um, uh, electrical conduction pathway. Uh, so since we have been developing all these self-healing polymers in the group, why don't we apply these for the uh, lithium ion battery for silicon uh, particles? So we tried it, uh, and the result was uh, uh, quite amazing. Um, if uh, we use the standard polymer binders that uh, people have been using, uh, these are uh, if uh, uh, you you are uh, you know some polymer names. Uh, these are some uh, PVDF uh, polymer. Um, uh, so basically, like acylene uh, chains of polymer CH two CH two, but some of the CH twos are replaced with uh, CF two, um, and those are the typical polymer people have been using. And um, if we use those polymers, uh, then the battery, so here is the cycling number. Uh, that means uh, we charge, discharge, that's one cycle. Uh, so here we look at how many cycles we can uh, charge and discharge the battery. And then how does the battery capacity change? Uh, we want uh, the, um, uh, very, uh, the battery to maintain high capacity. So here, uh, close to 3,000 milliamp hour per gram. This is uh, what silicon anode can get us. As a comparison here, the dashed gray line is what graphite can do. 
and you can see graphite can give uh, much, much, much lower, uh, hold much, much lower uh, capacity uh, compared to silicon. Uh, and then compared to this conventional polymer using self-healing polymer, we can maintain many, many cycles of charging, discharging, and still be able to uh, operate the battery. Uh, and then we subsequently studied um, different kinds of uh, particle sizes uh, because uh, there were previously people try to solve this problem by trying to use silicon nanoparticles as when the particle is small, uh, it will have, even though it undergoes the same volume expansion, but when the size is in the nanometer size, uh, the fracture mechanics completely changes uh, and they become less likely to fracture. But the problem is uh, nanoparticles are very, very expensive. Uh, they are more challenging to make. So th this is the typical price, uh, but the silicon micro particles, so these are micron size particles or hundreds of nanometer particles. These are basically polysilicon that's um, uh, used to, uh, to make solar cells and make, used to make uh, silicon wafers for uh, microelectronics industry. And these uh, micron particles are made by just grinding the um, polysilicon. So they are really dirt cheap. And this is, uh, we're not even buying in a uh, large quantity. We buy this uh, um, uh, some website and uh, uh, we can get it uh, at much lower price already, even just by a kilogram compared to the nanoparticles. And we show that uh, for the first time uh, at the time when we did this work that we were able to get um, uh, very good performance with the 800 nanometer particles. Uh, and uh, this uh, basically uh, provides a cost effective solution and uh, uh, also very high performance. Uh, so that, um, uh, and then we also look into the battery electrodes after uh, charging, discharging uh, many times. Um, <laughs> this is a, a scanning electron microscopy of the uh, electrode. Uh, after uh, charging, discharging 100 cycles, we uh, take apart the battery. And then we take the electrode, we uh, break it, uh, kind of just break it, and then look at the side view, the cross section. Um, and then what you're looking at here is uh, the um, uh, particle together with the polymer. So after charging, discharging, the shape of the particle already disappeared. It just becomes this very dense layer. Um, but if um, you look at the cross section of uh, these are two other type of materials people typically use, uh, they were useful for nanoparticles, can stabilize nanoparticles, but not microparticles. So CMC is a type of cellulose material, PVDF is the other one I mentioned. And you can see here a lot of uh, porous structure. Uh, so that's due to the uh, fracture of the uh, uh, material. And uh, uh, also these kinds of uh, porous structure, uh, eventually uh, basically the battery stopped working because the porous structure, uh, in, within the porous structure, the particles lose contact with each other. Uh, and then it's no longer electrically conductive uh, to allow lithium to be able to deposit. And the other thing is uh, the fracture causes a lot of uh, new exposed surfaces. So every charging, discharging, when new surface is exposed, then there's electrochemical reaction that can take place and then slowly eat away the silicon and convert it uh, together with organics, convert it into some kind of uh, um, uh, insulating product that's no longer active for storing lithium. Uh, so this shows uh, the uh, strong contrast of using self-healing material and uh, these uh, other polymers. Uh, 
So this was the uh, very beginning of uh, work uh, my group started uh, in exploring self-healing polymer for battery uh, applications. Uh, and uh, currently, this concept uh, is being explored by various uh, other research groups uh, around the world to look at uh, other type of um, uh, related polymer designs. Uh, and uh, we, uh, since then, have um, uh, maybe I'll skip this. Have moved to materials uh, with even higher energy storage. Uh, so silicon is still being researched. Um, probably next generation um, in five years or ten years, silicon might be used. Uh, but then uh, in university, we're looking at uh, even further away uh, kind of technology. Uh, we designed the initial concept. Um, so we start, uh, decided to, to see how this concept, how far this concept can go, and can we really go to um, uh, more advanced battery uh, systems with even higher energy density. So currently we have a project that's um, uh, actually several projects uh, sponsored by Department of Energy, the um, uh, uh, battery uh, material research division on the um, uh, battery materials. And the goal there, uh, the project is called Battery 500. Uh, the goal there is to double the energy density of the current battery used for Tesla electrical vehicle. And uh, Tesla, you know, can only drive 250 miles uh, before the next charging. Uh, and um, the goal is to allow it to drive 500 miles with the same size of battery. So then that means it will double the energy density. So that's the goal and probably will take 10 years or longer to realize that goal because there are so many challenges, but it's a great area that allows a lot of uh, new ideas uh, to be um, incorporated because this is a, not a new problem. It's a 20 year old problem. People have been trying to make these batteries uh, uh, st uh, safe and reliable for many, many years and still cannot do it. Uh, so that's why new ideas um, need, uh, need to be incorporated. So uh, that's why uh, we started to shift to focus on these lithium metal based uh, anode uh, for batteries. Uh, then here, if you look at the, how the battery operates, somewhat diff this is somewhat different from uh, using graphite. In the case of graphite, you have a, essentially a host and the lithium is protected or is being hosted by this graphite. So they're kind of protected and they can be very stable. Uh, but the thing with lithium metal is that, and also uh, to get this high energy density, you notice the unit is per kilogram. So this per kilogram includes the weight of everything in this battery, include the weight of the electrode and this um, uh, uh, current collector, which is made of uh, typically made of copper, but copper is very thick. So we are also trying to um, uh, basically not use any copper and have lithium metal directly deposited to remove this weight. And then the weight of separator, weight of electrolyte, weight of um, uh, the uh, cathode, all of them are used in this equation to calculate the energy density. So in order to get this high energy density, the graphite is removed. There's only pure lithium. So you take away some weight from the, um, uh, from the anode and it's pure lithium. But the problem is there's no host to protect the lithium to make it stable. And then when lithium metal is formed, this is by an electrochemical reduction of lithium ion, uh, then it cannot grow in a very controlled way. It forms these dendrites. There could be some non-uniformity. And as soon as there's a spot that's non-uniform and have uh, potentially a place where ion can accumulate very quickly, then uh, the growth becomes very rapid and forms this dendrite. 
And then the dendrite can penetrate through the separator. And if it penetrates through, lithium metal is conductive. If it uh, touches the cathode, uh, then it will short. Uh, if there's a shorting in the electrical circuit, what happens? It heats up. So once it heats up, uh, then the electrolytes are flammable. So then they catch fire. And that's when you hear in a lot of the news uh, that uh, lithium battery uh, catches fire. Uh, well, that's not yet using lithium metal. That's just graphite based, but you can have defects that cause the dendrite to grow. And uh, then uh, there are many approaches that people have been exploring to try to uh, eliminate the issue of forming the um, uh, dendrite. Uh, people try, since the lithium is in contact with electrolyte, they try to uh, change the chemistry of electrolyte so that dendrite is difficult to grow. And they put a protecting layer on the surface to prevent dendrite growth. Uh, they put a host uh, to hold the lithium so that provides some uh, protection. And then also people have used the polymer coating on the surface. Uh, it can be called solid electrolyte interface, uh, can be an artificial one. Uh, and people try to put a polymer layer that's uh, very, very strong so that if you form dendrite, this dendrite cannot penetrate through this polymer layer and then prevent the shorting. Uh, so when we, uh, we thought that, well, these methods, uh, people have been trying them for many years and still haven't solved the problem. So we should try something different, a different idea. Uh, so then uh, it, there comes the um, self-healing polymer again. Um, and uh, here, our rationale is that the dendrites are formed because as lithium gets deposited, uh, then lithium also will grow in the layer thickness. And as it grow, it will start to generate some non-uniformity at, um, at the interface with the uh, liquid electrolyte. And this non-uniformity can cause um, uh, the interface layer, I mentioned SEI earlier, cause it to break. And once it break, ion can go to this uh, opening very quickly, and then uh, lithium will grow rapidly and then immediately form this dendrite. So our thinking is our self-healing polymer, if we coat the self-healing polymer here, uh, even though it's very soft, it's in contrary to the concept that people have been using before using tough polymer. Here, we use a very soft polymer. But the thing is, this polymer has the unique property. Uh, if, if you look at the microscope image here, if we poke a hole on the uh, polymer, after 30 seconds, 60 seconds, this hole essentially kind of heal by itself. That's because of the um, polymer network that we design. Uh, it's held together by these weak hydrogen bonding. So the molecules, even though the film looks like a solid, but the, in the molecular scale, these molecules, so these red chains are exchanging with each other. And these clippers can break and close, break and close in a dynamic fashion. So these um, uh, red polymer chains are constantly exchanging uh, in the molecular scale. That's why when there's a non-uniformity, so when there's a hole, the polymer can actually feel the hole on its own because it's actually mobile. And then uh, we characterize this by using rheology to characterize. Uh, we measure the um, storage modulus, loss modulus, uh, and for a liquid like material, the loss modulus typically would be higher than the um, uh, storage modulus. That's how we characterize a material that looks like a solid, but it's actually behaving like a liquid. So just to give you an example of the rheological definition of liquid, uh, if you think about CAT, uh, there is this Nobel Prize uh, uh, called Eager, 
uh, Nobel Prize in physics. So Harvard University awards this every year. Uh, and uh, I think two or three years ago, they awarded to the finding that cat, uh, do you think cat is a liquid or a solid? Uh, so uh, it was determined to be liquid because liquid will fill in any space um, if you put this uh, kind of uh, substance in there and the cat can do that. So that's, but it looks like a solid, right? So that's the kind of material that, that we have. Uh, Liquid-like behavior, but looks like a solid. That's why we can use it as a coating. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's the basic concept. Uh, I won't go into too much detail. We, um, uh, without this polymer coating, uh, there are dendrites formed. You can see all these um, uh, kind of chunky column-like uh, lithium. And then with the coating, we completely change the way lithium grow. Um, and uh, uh, it becomes very dense and uh, uh, very smooth. Uh, so this um, allowed us to uh, make uh, lithium metal now much more stable compared to previously possible. Uh, so our research has been since then, that was discovered in 2016. And since then, we have been trying to understand what is really going on in these systems. How does the polymer dynamics impact the growth of lithium? How does the chemistry of the polymer coating impact the growth of lithium. So now we have um, a, a group of us, including my group, uh, Professor Yi Chui's group, and also Professor Jian Qing from uh, chemical engineering, who does uh, molecular level simulation. So we are now um, uh, having a team working together to study this class of polymer. And we're extending it uh, to, um, uh, to various uh, different kinds of uh, uh, structure. Uh, so for example, uh, these are some new uh, dynamic structures uh, that we have uh, designed that um, uh, gives one of the best um, uh, coatings uh, that's ever reported for lithium metal protection. So now we start to understand uh, little by little kind of the requirements for this coding design. And then uh, this coding design, we're also expanding it to uh, solid state electrolyte design uh, where the ion transport is also important. Uh, so those are, uh, let me see, I won't go into these detail. Yeah. So basically, yeah. Those are the, um, uh, the, the key areas um, uh, we are working on uh, in kind of use design novel polymers to uh, enable, kind of ident first identify what are the key problems in the uh, battery field. So I only talked about lithium metal and then that's the uh, anode side. There's also cathode. Cathode has uh, basically right now for uh, the next generation electrical vehicle, there are two choices of material, uh, sulfur or NMC. So we're also looking at how these polymers are going to protect uh, the cathode material and what kind of chemistry is important uh, at the interface and also for the electrolyte. Uh, and using the unique polymer design, uh, now we start to gain the fundamental understanding that's needed. Uh, and uh, I think it's a, a quite exciting time that uh, there are a lot of different aspects uh, of uh, polymer design. Uh, we can study and how that impact the um, energy storage and the electrochemistry. Yeah, so this is my research group. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a very uh, diverse group uh, having uh, about 40 plus researchers in the group, half postdocs, half our graduate students. 
and uh, coming from all kinds of background and uh, people collaborate with each other and also collaborate with um, uh, other research groups. Uh, so on the battery project, Yi Cui and Jian Qing are my main collaborators uh, and also with uh, Slack, formerly um, uh, Dr. Mike Tony uh, was our main collaborator uh, understanding the polymers and to do some in-situ materials study using x-ray. Um, uh, but currently the techniques are already set up. So we're continuing to use those um, uh, advanced x-ray techniques uh, to study our materials. Uh, and then funding is uh, mainly uh, funded by DOE on these uh, projects. Um, so I'll be very interested in talking to any student who is interested in polymer science and uh, their um, application in energy storage or electronics. We have many projects that are electronics related. Okay, all right, now I'll open up for questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Bao. Uh, we have questions for two people. So I saw already saw like two people raising their hand. Uh, I'll ask the first person to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Professor Bao, for the wonderful talk. Um, you alluded to some work that you're doing with Tesla. And personally, as someone who is really interested in electric vehicles, could you tell me a little more about what are some of the efforts for commercialization of self-healing electrodes in batteries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, um, uh, well, the, the, the way I think about uh, commercialization is uh, uh, either if I have a student excited about doing that, uh, then I help the student to start a company. Um, we have started uh, three companies from the group uh, and another PhD student who worked on stretchable battery and now uh, got a Tomcat grant um, and he hopes to start his company on uh, flexible batteries. And um, but uh, otherwise, because uh, I'm not going to leave Stanford, so I uh, usually, uh, my, I see my role is to help my students to become successful. Uh, then at the same time, we work with uh, companies, um, uh, especially on technologies uh, that requires uh, uh, sophisticated manufacturing. And in those cases, uh, large companies may have advantages and there we I have collaborations, uh, sponsor research with companies, um, uh, as well as um, uh, eventually licensing the um, IP to companies uh, so that company can further develop it uh, and uh, commercialize it. Um, in the battery field, uh, incorporating a new material into the commercial space takes a very long time um, for the the, the battery we're using currently, they were developed uh, more than 20 years ago, and we're still using the same material. And to get any new material into this, um, into the commercial space uh, is going to take a long time. But this rate is accelerating very quickly because there's a, still, uh, there's a very strong market draw uh, that is the electrical vehicle really needs better batteries. And so I hope uh, uh, it will be a much shorter time timeline. Um, but DOE is looking at 10 years uh, later for lithium metal based uh, electrical vehicle batteries. Uh, Josh, <coughs> hi. hi, Professor. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. Um, I was wondering the the key parameter that you that we've been discussing is uh, energy density, um, and obviously that has massive implications for uh, vehicles because uh, you need to store the same amount of energy uh, in the same amount or more energy in the same weight, as well as wearable technologies. Mm -hmm. um, is that same parameter uh, the key parameter for? Um, grid scale energy storage and in general uh, what you see as the future for the technology you're developing for, for grid scale energy storage? Yeah, for grid scale energy storage, the uh, size and the weight uh, are not as important consideration, but the cost is an extremely important consideration because uh, the, uh, for the grid scale 
energy is competing. Basically, it's solar energy plus the cost of energy storage competing with um, uh, what we are currently using from the uh, power plants. Uh, coal firing power plants or natural gas power plants. So that price currently is still very low. And then the grid storage price uh, needs to be competitive combined with the wind or solar to need to be competitive uh, compared to those other uh, choices in order for wide adoption by consumers. So in the end, it's still the price uh, that matters to consumer. So the uh, using materials that are extremely low cost is very important. So uh, in that space, my group doesn't work on it, but a lot of people are working with flow batteries, for example, for grid storage. Um, basically, you have a liquid tank, and then you have uh, redox molecules that can be oxidized or reduced. And it's large in size, but uh, the price is extremely low.